um, concept of fitness versus endurance. And this is something I'm particularly keen on at the moment. It's something I've been looking more into over the, the winter. Winter's always a good time to think about this because we talk about training getting us fit. Um, very broadly, we train to get fit, but what does that actually mean? Um, and then breaking it down, taking it another level into um, building endurance as well. Because sometimes the training that gets you fit doesn't bring you endurance. And as you will endurance athletes, this is, this is, the, this is the key to, to really our training with you. So, what I want to talk about are the definitions of fitness and endurance how we as sports scientists might measure them and explaining some of the physiology of each and also the differences in the physiology of each. Um, then we're going to talk about how we improve these parameters, the approaches we might take in your training both in the winter and in the pre-season um, and in particular this how the quick fix approach you know going out and doing these um, you, you might have, have heard of, of people that go out and do um, sweet spot training almost from the, the, the day dot when they get back going in November um, and why personally I don't think that works I think it's more about building the foundation first and then layering in the sweet spot later in the year so you'll hear you, you, you'll read on forum people that are doing two times 20 minute blocks of sweet spot right from October November and they do it year round just blunts the tool in my opinion so we'll, we'll come, come back to that and then from my perspective, how we monitor the improvements. So what are the kinds of things that I'm looking at in your training files on a day-to-day -day basis to see how not only your fitness is improving, but also how much of that endurance component you're improving as well. Being fit. It's a bit of a brainstorm. What does being fit mean to you? To having fitness, what does it mean? Tony? Okay, so that's that would be your measure of I'm fit, I can recover yeah. for the next day. Yeah, yeah. the way the heart can down once okay. it's stopped. Yep, yep. What other measures of I feel fit? What would you, what would you describe if you're feeling fit? Ability to compete. Ability to compete. Ability to dish out pain to other people when you're pain. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You're very fit. <laughs> well, no, we, we just talked about your measure, didn't we? Yeah. Your yeah. five-hour club ride, and you know you can sit on the front the club yeah. and let them all rotate around you and you can tolerate that yeah. and then you know you're fit. Yeah. Anything else? No, it's being able to do whatever you want to do, isn't yeah. it? Not just being a complete slob and you know, going a mile down the road and trying mm. to get off for a rest. Sometimes I have that sensation when it's me delivering the pain to myself rather than the session inflicting pain on me. I'm in control of the pain. I'm the pain mm. might feel the same, but I'm in control of it. Mm. That's sometimes how I'd measure mm. fit. God, we're going to say this, aren't we? Right. Um, if you open up any physiological textbook, as you might do for your bedtime reading, um, they would talk about a high rate of energy turnover um, and the ability to do that by aerobic metabolism. And classically, we'd be measuring that by the, the VO2 max, the maximal oxygen uptake. And most of you in this room have had a mouthpiece in and had your VO2 max measured. The higher your VO2 max, the fitter you're deemed to be. Um, whereas endurance is being able to sustain a high percentage of that VO2 max. So you've got your upper ceiling, your VO2 max, and that's how fit you are, and your ability to endure a high percentage of that VO2 max is endurance. <coughs> In terms of the lab measurements that we would, um, we would use, we would measure endurance with the lactate thresholds, so that's where we're taking the fingertip samples in incrementing three minute stages. And typically that lactate threshold in a group such as yourselves is between 65 to 75% of your maximum. So really it's an ability to exercise at a high percentage of your VO2 max without accumulating 
the, the lactic acid in, in your blood. I think the lactate threshold is, um, it is a measure of endurance. It's certainly different to what it measures um, compared to VO2 max tests. But really we're expecting a lactate threshold protocol that's um, got relatively short stage durations, you know, three to four minutes depending on which lab you're going into. It's great to get a blood lactate steady state, um, but how can that three or four minute stage really reflect your endurance when a lot of us race over longer distances than three or four minutes. And actually lately a lot of the, the, the talk within the physiology world is about blood lactate, does it actually indicate fatigue anyway? There's an awful lot going on in the muscles, the, the central system with your breathing, the heart, the lungs, that blood lactate is one measure that we can take, okay it's an easy measure to take, but is it telling us everything about the meta metabolism that's going on in, in the muscles? Come back to that all in a moment, but just to, to, to remind you that all the studies that have looked at exercise performance across running, cycling, other endurance events, they say that VO2 max is a good measure at explaining performance as long as you've got a very mixed group of athletes. So a four and a half litre per minute athlete will be better than a three litre per minute athlete. In broad terms, you'd, you'd expect that to be the case. If we add lactate threshold values into the equation, it improves the predictive power. We get a better idea of performance in groups um, who are then a similar fitness. So for a group of individuals such as yourself, which is, you know, 3 litre VO2 max might be um, an active individual, 4.5 litres is more an athletic individual. Talk about men here. So if you've got a group of male um, cyclists who are all very, very similar um, VO2 max, adding the lactate threshold in enables us to distinguish performance a little bit better. So that athlete that's got a higher lactate threshold as a percentage of max is going to win the race. So if we take that 4.5 litre per minute VO2 max um, value, an athlete whose lactate threshold is at 75% compared to an athlete at 60%, athlete A is going to be able to work higher, at a higher power output than athlete B. Chances are, assuming their economy and their efficiency is the same, athlete A is going to win the race. I love this photo. Lance Armstrong looking in pain. Doesn't happen very often. It's just after he's finished the uh, New York Marathon. Um, what controls VO2 max? <coughs> so we're now going into some of the, the physiology differences between VO2 max and lactate threshold. Well, VO2 max is really um, measured or it kind of explains to us physiologists the cardiovascular system. So everything that's about taking oxygen in and delivering that oxygen to the muscles. So it's about the system where you're taking air in the mouth, um, you're taking oxygen from the blood in the lungs, distributing it down into the muscles. So things that are controlling VO2 max are things like stroke volume, that's the amount of blood that you're pumping out of the heart um, every beat, the heart rate, uh, the, the, the blood flow, the resistance to blood flow in the capillaries, and the carriage of oxygen bound up in haemoglobin. So those are all cardiovascular, they're central um, underpinnings. But if we move on to what controls the lactate threshold, it's more peripheral, okay? It's more what's going on in the leg, the muscle tissue itself. So it's your ability to take that oxygen out of the blood that's gone into the muscles. And this is gonna be dependent on your muscle fiber type. All of you in this room have probably got very different muscle fiber distribution. Um, Mitochondria, do people know anything about mitochondria? They're a bit like the, the, um, like the, the, the fuel burning, the gas um, houses of the, the muscle, greenhouses, that's the word I'm looking for, greenhouses of the muscle, in that that's about where, that's where you're going to combust all of that oxygen that you're taking in. So it's the real oxidative machinery of the muscle. And within the mitochondria you get all these enzymes to break down um, all the gases into a usable form and converting them into usable energy within the 
uh, the muscle. And of course you need fuel for those um, enzymatic processes as well. So these are all happening within the muscle tissue, uh, so they're peripheral factors. So you can see VO2 max is central, it's about delivering the oxygen, and lactate threshold is about using it. Um, this is taken on um, me on my bike today. Um, I had to carry a bag because my back pocket wasn't big enough for my waterproof. Um, <laughs> Leslie had to help me there today to get my rain jacket in and out. Um, but this kind of describes the um, conduction of oxygen transfer from breathing in from the air, taking it into the lungs. The heart then pumps that blood out, oxygenated blood out to the muscle and inside the muscle, the mitochondria, taking all that oxygen in and using it to produce energy. So all you need to take from that is the very fact that there are two systems. The VO2 max measures your central ability and the lactate threshold measures your peripheral ability. And you as athletes will all have very, very different strengths and weaknesses in that profile. Some of you will have a high VO2 max, some of you will have a relatively low VO2 max but you're able to use a high percentage of it for a long period of time. What I'm going to go through now, I'm just going to begin building this model that was um, actually uh, proposed by Ed Coyle. You might have come across Ed Coyle's name um, simply because he wrote a paper on Lance Armstrong um, looking at um, Armstrong's seven years kind of building up as a, as a Tour de France champion. And big paper when it was published because everyone was excited to see um, lab test data on Lance Armstrong. It was um, published in one of the top journals in our area, the Journal of Applied Physiology. Everyone jumped on it. And then as people started to, to, to look at the data, they thought that doesn't quite match up. And, um, so it's come under a lot of criticism, but Coyle's basically been in the, even the cycling media press. You go onto cyclingnews.com, you look in Ed Coyle and this article and all this con controversy will come up. Um, one thing that Coyle's done, he's very famous for his work in cycling physiology, and he's basically taken um, the ultimate component that we're all interested in, performance, and for us it's, it's power. Ultimately it transfers into velocity on the bike, but really this is the controllable. And the two factors of VO2 max and being able to sustain a high percentage of it, your lactate threshold I mentioned there. Coyle also adds in an anaerobic potential because as well as the oxidative system, the aerobic system, which these two cover, we've also got this anaerobic potential. And to you, anaerobic, you probably associate with going above a sustainable power, going above your 25 mile time trial pace or an hour criterion level, where you're digging deep for short bursts and you use energy um, that doesn't have to come from oxygen use. It's, it's stored there, but of course it's short term, isn't it? We can only burn it off. Um, and then replace it, but then you've got like a limited supply of it. So we need to remember really is that energy expenditure, we've got aerobic and anaerobic processes. And when we're working anaerobically, it's then that we're producing lactic acid. I mentioned earlier on that the, the lactate threshold improves your ability to distinguish performances. Um, this is the paper we just submitted to German Sports Sciences, I say about six months ago now, um, where we measured, I um, can't remember how many, count the dots and you can tell me how many uh, female cyclists, in uh, fact Leslie was part of this study. It's a long time ago, it's how long it takes to get things published in sports science. Um, but as you can see here, the, the relationship between lactate threshold and 10 minute time trial time isn't that great. If you took these three people out, yes, you might get a better relationship, the, the line might go through there. But in science, you can't take three people out. That's called cheating. Um, so here you've got people who have got a relatively high lactate threshold, VO2, 2.6, that's pretty good. But their performance time isn't that great, it's 25 and a half. Not compared to these people here who are doing 22 minute tens, and actually seem to have a lower lactate threshold. 
So something's missing in that model that I just started to show you. And in fact, what that difference is, that different component is mechanical efficiency. Efficiency is um, also uh, you can look at another very, very similar component called economy is the amount of oxygen that you require to develop a lot of work. Um, so what we did then was we looked at the same group of riders, we looked at their 10 mile TT time again, but we looked at their economy. So how well do they um, use their oxygen? So two riders producing the same power output might use a different amount of oxygen. And those riders that can produce more power for a given amount of oxygen are going to be the faster riders. And this is why I bang on and bang on and bang on about cadence to develop your cadence, to develop your efficiency. Because for the first time we've shown that this very, very strong relationship between economy and time trial performance. Is this all making sense so far? Yeah? Okay. What is um What's a determinant of efficiency? Because if efficiency or economy is so important to time trialing um, and to the, the rider in a breakaway in a road race or ultra endurance athletes, because it's really important to use that oxygen as sparingly as you can, how can we get more efficient? Well, it seems to be that the more efficient athletes are those that have got a lot of slow twitch fibers, type one, as we would call them. And certainly the running literature also suggests there's a lot to do with anthropometry, the, the body dimensions, and the elasticity of the muscle tissue. And in fact, research has come out that suggests you don't stretch if you're a runner, because if you stretch as a runner, you lose some of the elastic return properties in your muscles, which then will make you use more oxygen. So there's a big thing about three or four years ago, all came out in the, the running magazines, don't stretch. Um, cycling is probably less important. Um, talked a little bit yesterday about whether stretching improves performance or improves recovery. Um, it's, it's, it's debatable, but for me, if stretching helps you reduce the, the chances of injury, makes you feel better after exercise, then, then, then go for it. The thing about efficiency, um, it's really heavily linked to your ability to withstand fatigue. The more efficient the rider is, the more likely they are to hold off that fatigue that develops over those race performances. Let's go back to endurance when we're talking about the context of this fatigue tolerance. Now, most of you know what it's like to ride at um, lactate threshold. In fact, I make sure that you do three or four hours of it. So you know what it feels like to ride at lactate threshold, top end of zone two. And it's, it's accomplishable, isn't it? Um, what's the one thing that makes riding at lactate threshold become fatiguing? It's time, isn't it? You could all go out and do um, an hour of zone two, drop of a hat, absolutely fine. But what becomes a challenge is when we go up to two hours, three hours, four hours. When we're out here this week, you can get up to five hours. <laughs> Didn't put my warning up, did I? <laughs> Turn off all mobile phones. So yeah, it's um, even at lactate threshold intensity, which you get the fueling in, you stay hydrated, it should be very, very manageable. But that time element, there's something about time that brings on fatigue. And what is it? You're producing heat in the muscles. That might be a factor. Certainly fuel is important, both the ability to use it in the muscles, but also what's going in. And muscle fibre recruitment as well. As time goes on, the muscle fibres that you're using to um, generate the, the movement, they're going to use up the fuel within those fibres, so you then have to start looking at other fibres. So all these things are going to be changing over time. They're not staying constant. 
I just wanted to show you what Coyle's model looks like in its entirety because it's not quite as simple as these bits here. Of course, we, we mustn't ever forget the impact that psychology has on performance or, or pacing or the fact that we're all, all trying to be as aerodynamic as we possibly can. Um, and really, these things along the bottom are all what I mentioned earlier on about those central and peripheral underpinnings of VO2 max and lactate threshold. But each training session that you're given, if we're targeting lactate threshold or VO2 max, it's these things that is actually changing. This is what we're trying to target. And that's why the subtleties of number of intervals, intensity of the intervals, the recovery durations between those intervals, they all change these bits of physiology. So it's not just as simple as going out and riding your bike. So we've just said that um, there's something about time that challenges your body's steady state. If we could just ride at that take threshold forever, um, this wouldn't be a talk I'd be doing. Um, there's something that goes on. Normally it's easily achievable. If we extend that time, we're going to be lowering our muscle energy stores, we're producing heat. And don't forget, we also decrease our water stores. Certainly in hard rides um, or hot rides, one of the things that the body will do is it will look around the body for, for stores of water somewhere. So it will start breaking down your muscle glycogen just to get water out. So that's another thing, another reason to keep drinking. You burn glycogen quicker if you're dehydrated. And as time goes on, we also start to recruit less efficient muscle fibres. If you've used all the glycogen in your slow twitch fibres, you're going to start recruiting your fast twitch fibres, and they're less efficient and the oxygen need goes up, even though the intensity stay in the same. And some of you have had this conversation with um, about decoupling. You might not have heard me use those words exactly. You might have heard me talking about a power heart rate index, and it comes in a percentage. Um, so this decoupling is where you might be at constant power and your heart rate is increasing, or you're at constant heart rate and the power is going down. Both of them will see an increase in the decoupling <coughs> index over time. And this is the way that we calculate it. Um, it's a percentage change between the power and heart rate in the first half of the workout compared to the same over the second half. Just let you have a look through that through that example. As you can see there, the power stays the same. Heart rate's gone up by 10 beats per minute. In that particular example, we're getting a, a medium decoupling of just under 5%. Is, that, is everyone okay with that? It's a concept making, making sense. Okay. So in... Um, the WKO software that I use, it's really nice. We get a, a percentage figure here. Um, and it's really, really useful to see over the, the longer endurance rides that are riders um, around that lactate threshold power. So it's really useful for me to be able to track that index over a period of a month, two months, three months, particularly over the winter. Um, because it allows me to see how you're coping with the training load. Um, it gives me an idea of where you're at in terms of improving that depth of endurance. I always talk about depth of endurance that you can't get by skipping zone two work. Um, the degree of decoupling that I'm seeing is telling me where you are and where you need to be and how we adjust the training load accordingly. So, if you're getting a moderate amount, then you're sufficiently stressed. It means that there's a, there's a stimulus going into those muscle fibres that will make, make them change, adapt after they've had a bit of time to, to recover. Um, if, we, if we get it hugely wrong, chances are you won't have finished the session, um, or we'll see excessive decoupling where the fatigue just goes on and on and on. Um, that just indicates a, a too, too high load. And these are some of the, um, like the a broad scheme, scheme of things. So 5 to 10 is about, is about medium stress. 
as the decoupling um, gets lower, it's time then to maybe step up your training, either in volume or intensity. Right, at this moment, I want to come out and show you um, my fictitious athlete. Okay, this ride, just about an hour and a half, um, average power output 192 watts, the normalised power for those of you that um, use WKO. 225. But interestingly, um, this is relatively early on in the winter's training, and you can see I've got a decoupling rate there of about 7.3%. So in other words, I mean, it's an hour and a half. It's not a really long ride at lactate threshold, but still we've got considerable um, change in the power heart rate relationship over the course of that ride. Now, if we were to look at the same athlete. I had real bad problems with, with linking this earlier today. Let's give this one a go. Now, later on, we can see that there's actually um, very similar normal power, a longer ride, and the de degree of de decoupling has degree de uh, decreased to less than 1%. So the average power, so if you were to just judge your ride on fitness, the power stayed the same. But now you're at a point where you can go for longer, and the degree of fatigue within that ride has, has shortened. Does that, does that make sense that there's, there's two things going on there? There's, um, although the average, the, the normalised power is very, very similar, so the stress of the ride the input seems to be the same, but how you're coping with it is very, very different. Yeah? It's very different to a rider. Um, Go back to that hour and a half file we just saw a moment ago. We're not necessarily always looking for increases in average power or normalised power. That tells me your fitness might be going up, your lactate threshold is moving up might go up by 20 to 30 watts. It's actually about that ability to sustain it over time. As a concept, is that, is that clear? Yeah? Okay. So for me, the usefulness of this analysis here is, um, is telling me about whether we need to increase your training load, adjust your training zones, and just generally monitoring fatigue. Because another thing is, quite often, I can look weekend to weekend, say if you're um, two or three weeks into a particular training block, first week of the block, you might handle that same session the lower power heart rate, <coughs> but then later on in the block there might be additional stress as the training load is accumulating and you might see the power heart rate go up. So it might not be telling me anything about fitness or endurance, it might actually be also telling me something about fatigue. I famously talk about my <coughs> three times three hour in zone three back to back experiment. Um, well, you can't really see the, the file very well, but as you know, yellow would be um, power, heart rate you might see there. Um, 
but you can see it's got like a, a flat line. So this is three hours. To make it even worse, I did it on a turbo. Um, average power, 197 watts, and my average heart rate was 157 beats per minute for the total ride. Now, you can't see it here, but this is day one of the block. My power to heart rate was 0.1. So in other words, I got to a point, this is the, end, the last week of a block where I was going from um, hour rides in zone three up to this three hour, three times three hour effort. Um, so point one, so I was obviously very well adapted to zone three exercise, I had a very deep endurance ability. So day one, absolutely fine, thoroughly enjoyed myself. Day number two, same time, same place, turbo. What, how I managed to pick the worst weather say that the worst weather in history to, to do this three day block. But again, I was driven indoors on the turbo. Still fine, you know, um, 197 watts, 156 beats per minute. Second day of the block, like I say, 3.42, my power heart rate. So I've gone from 0.1 to 3.42. The thing with zone three exercise is it's tolerable. You can do it, it's fine. It's focused, but it's tolerable. But the biggest challenge is recovering from them to do them again the next day. And one of the progressions, firstly, is to get an athlete to be able to tolerate three hours in zone three. The next progression that most of the time athletes aren't ready till the following year it really means that underpinning endurance needs to come. You might do two times three. And then when you really can tolerate a lot of zone three, you might do the, the third block, the third day block. Um, and again, 197 watts, 157 beats per minute. Um, the training stress was 4.1. So you remember, it went 0.1, 3.42, and now it's only gone up to 4.1. Um, I've added an extra trace on this graph, though, because what I had to do to keep it tolerable, I had to drop my cadence by about 10, uh, 10 RPM with an hour to go. There was no way I could have kept up in the mid-90s, I had to drop it just to complete the ride, and that's probably why my, my power heart rate ratio didn't continue climbing on day three. But I've, I've told some people, um, the result of this was I then had four days off the bike just to completely get it all out of my system. But my hands had swollen so much, um, my fingers were so swollen, painfully, I couldn't even bend my, my fingers. And I think it just shows you the turbo thing and, and working at that level, the, the amount of fluid shifts you get. And I was drinking copious amounts of water during this ride, but it, it wasn't enough to get in the right places at the right time. So these rides are very, very stressful. So hopefully this has just shown you that um, fitness and endurance aren't the same thing. So you can feel fit, you might be able to go out and ride a very good 10 mile time trial. Um, or sprint pretty well in a, in, a, in a road race. If you've been able to protect yourself within the bunch, you still might be able to clip away at the end, fine. But what you can't get away with is racing those races without developing, um, sorry, de uh, racing longer races without developing that underlying endurance ability. So fitness allows you to work at high power outputs, endurance allows you to sustain those higher power outputs. It explains why in your training um, you need to have that layering. You need to lift the power and then you need to build time at that power and that's why we always incrementally go zone 2, zone 3, zone 4. Um, just because it's about nudging those training zones up so you might start 15 minute blocks. At the moment people are doing zone 3 sweet spot work, blocks within longer rides and you know where we're going to be in a couple of months' time. You're going to be doing whole rides at those same powers. It doesn't feel particularly inspiring at the moment to be going out and doing maybe two-hour efforts, what we were doing 20-minute blocks at, 15, 20-minute blocks at today, but you do get there. It's all about developing that underlying endurance. And you can't suddenly leap into those higher-end powers. You've got to do the base works first. Get all those peripheral bits of machinery in place in order to be able to bump up that level of metabolic steady state.